just have one electron, it's attracted to just one nucleus. And then in terms of kinetic energy, you have a smaller orbital and a greater confinement energy and a faster motion for the electron. And then when you compare that to your shared electron, which is on the right, um, it's attracted to two nuclei, so the potential energy is lower. And for your kinetic energy, you have this larger orbital and less confinement and a slower motion. So those are some like nice compare and contrast for this. Then we kind of talked about valence bond theory. So basically the valence electrons are the ones involved in bonding. Um, and your uh, atomic orbitals basically interfere to form molecular orbitals. So they can either interfere constructively and generate those bonding molecular orbitals that are a lower energy or destructively interfere to create your anti-bonding orbitals at a higher energy. Um, another quick note is that they are formed at the same time. It's just whether they're filled or not is the difference, but you can't just have like a lone bonding orbital. There'll also be that anti-bonding orbital that's formed. I'm seeing chat stuff. Oh, um, yeah. I can go through the slides again at the end of the whole thing as well. Um, yeah, I don't know what we're doing in terms of sharing slides, I forget, but I can definitely go through it at the end. Um, yeah, so just remember that there's two electrons per orbital, like that's the max. Um, and then you wanna fill your orbitals in a molecular orbital diagram from lowest to highest energy. And then you make sure to fill each orbital at the same energy level before pairing them. Um, and we'll see an example of that, I think, on the next slide. Nope, never mind. A few slides from now. Um, another thing I would definitely know is what your bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals look like. So on the top row, we have the S orbitals combining, and it kind of forms like a larger thing. And then your antibonding always has that node. Um, so for the S orbital, it looks like a peanut, I think. And then when you have your P orbitals, you combine them together and you'll get this kind of candy shape for your sigma 2P. And then with your antibonding, you have this weird note node in like in the middle as well. Cool. Um, and then this will be your kind of your sigma head-on collision. Your pi bond always forms from a longitudinal. So what basically happens here is that this kind of interacts on the top and bottom and you get this like hamburger shape for your bonding. And then for your antibonding, you get this node in the middle and then kind of like a four leaf clover kind of thing. So I know the shapes of those, you might be asked to identify them, fun stuff. And then here's the molecular orbital energy diagrams that we kind of worked on a bit. So um, kind of one important thing about this is that when you're looking at nitrogen into the left on the periodic table, you're gonna have kind of like Christmas tree. So your pi 2p will be lower in energy compared to your sigma 2p which is then kind of flipped in oxygen into the right, which is more of this O shape. Um, so your sigma is lower in energy than your pi's right here. But for the most part, they're generally the same. Um, you have your kind of one S's combining to make your sigmas. And then you also have your two S in your sigma bonds, sigma and sigma star, and then two P. Um, you'll have kind of the pi's and the sigmas as well. So I would definitely make sure to label, well, I, I guess you're not drawing technically, but I would definitely be able to like identify what comes from what. So like the sigma 2p and knowing like what corresponds to what. Um, another helpful thing that you probably want to know is bond order, which is one half the bonding electrons minus the antibonding electrons. Um, I would definitely know that. Um, I think there was some slip ups in terms of counting like the orbitals, but you want to count the electrons in the bonding molecular orbitals versus the antibonding. Um, and if you have a higher bond order, you have a stronger bond and a shorter bond. And then the other thing that I always forget is magnetism. So can't, I'm going to mess up how I say this, but like diamagnetism is no unpaired electrons and then paramagnetism can't, is like unpaired electrons. Um, so they can ask you a question about that and it'll be good to keep those straight in your head. Awesome. Another thing we talked about was hybridization. So basically your atomic orbitals are polarized by nearby atomic orbitals. So a carbon is polarized differently by, based on the number of hydrogen atoms nearby it. 
Um, the ways to figure out how, like, how they're hybridized is you basically draw the Lewis structure, which hopefully was covered in unit two. Um, and then you want to count your electron domains. And keep in mind that um, the unpaired electrons also count as the domain. Um, so don't forget that. And then you're basically your number of hybrid orbitals formed are the number of electron domains. So if you have three electron domains, that'd be an sp2. Um, yep. Can I still think of hybrid orbitals as atomic orbitals in a way? Um, hybrid orbitals are kind of like polarized atomic orbitals. I wouldn't, they're, it's like hybrid orbitals is kind of like an invention and like hybridization is kind of a thing that we came up with, but they're not the same thing. They're just kind of, things are polarized slightly differently. Um, to be polarized, I think it's just like deforming in shape. Um, so that's what we mean when it's getting polarized, like the shape of the orbital is gonna get slightly changed. Yeah. And then you might have remaining unhybridized orbitals. So typically we see that we have unhybridized p orbitals, which will then go into making our pi bonds. So for example, here, this might help make it make a little more sense. So if we have a carbon atom, um, it has four valence electrons. So two in the 2s and two in the 2p. Um, and so we would have this right here. And then when we hybridize it, um, and actually get to look at the whole molecule. But if we hybridize it in this molecule, since we have three electron domains, the two single bonds and the one double bond, you're gonna have three unpaired electrons that are hybridized and one electron that's unhybridized. Um, so basically the, these unhybridized, or these hybridized ones, sorry, form the sigma bonds. And then this unhybridized one forms the pi bond. Cool. I don't think we really talked about kinetic energy and potential energy of hybrid orbitals. I would definitely know that, I, I wasn't able to draw it clearly here, but there's a practice problem like it. I would definitely know that the potential energy of like the sp2 is in between a 2s and a 2p in terms of energy. And the more, I don't know how much detail you need to know, but the more p character there is, the higher in energy it is. Cause there's like, if you have an sp3, that'll be the closest to a 2p or like an energy. And then if you have like an SP, that would be like smack dab in the middle of a 2S and 2P. Um, we have an atom with seven electrons around it. Would it have number of electron domains as four? I think I'd have to see an example. Um, but yeah, if, if technically, if you yeah. have, yeah, I guess so. I don't think we really encountered like, um, just single electrons around an atom, um, too much in this class. But yeah, if you have like, you'd have this three paired electrons to make six, and then you have that like one lone one, I guess that'd be four electron domains. Um, are the sp2 and 2p energies degenerate? I forget what degenerate means. I don't know if one of the other TAs can take it. Um, yeah. And then would we finish filling 2p orbitals before going back and filling the hybrid ones? Oh, are the sp2 and 2? Oh yeah, no, they're at different energy levels. I can't believe I forgot that word, but yes, it's been a long day. Okay, yeah. So they're at different energy levels. The more p character, the higher it is 2p, but it's not exactly. Um, let's see, would we finish filling 2p orbitals before going back and filling the hybrid orbitals? Um, not sure what that refers to. If you're talking about like this middle diagram, you'd first want to fill the lower energy ones um, before you fill the higher energy. For multiple bonds, we need a hybrid orbital for each bond. Um, for a double bond, you have that unpaired 2p orbital, and then you would have like your sp or whatever the hybridization is, um, you would just have, you'd have to have that unpaired 2p at least for that double bond. Yeah, I would have to see an example, but I think we can like work through one um, and I'll make it a little bit clearer. Cool. So then we talk more generally about, oh wait, yeah, okay, then we talk more generally about bonding differences. So we have these like three bonds that we compared. So for metallic, um, they're at a low electronegativity and all the electrons are held 
um, loosely. So that's where you get the whole electron C model. Ionic bonds have a very high electronegativity difference. Um, and they basically like hog the electrons to themselves. So the electrons are localized. And then covalent is like the best, uh, or like it has a high electronegativity. Um, so the electrons are localized, but neither can really take the electron density. So covalent is kind of what we talked about earlier with all the bonding and stuff. Um, yeah. I do. Um, generally, metals have low ionization energies, and there's kind of small changes in ionization energy across the row. Um, can anyone explain as to why that is? Yeah, Emma, go for it. Um, so when you look at, in particular, like the ones in the middle, you actually notice that the 4S orbital fills before the 3D because it's slightly lower energy. But that means that um, the shielding electrons are in the way. So as you gain an electron and it goes into the, D, the 3D orbital, there's um, it's just counterbalancing the core charge going up. So the effective core charge isn't changing much. Yeah, exactly. Like the 3D and 4S are really similar in energy. Um, and the core charge doesn't really increase because you're like adding to the 3D and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, good, nice explanation. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think that's this slide. Um, definitely the electron C model. Um, so you have your like nuclei and the electrons are very delocalized and are loosely held. Um, and the important thing about this is that electrons like can flow and are not attached to a specific atom. And then you kind of get these four properties coming up. So connectivity, um, malleability, high melting point, and shininess. Does anyone want to take one or two of these properties and kind of explain them? Yeah, um, I don't know how to say your name, but Alois, I think. Yep, which ones? Um, choose your favorite. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can do eight. Okay, let me do um, conductivity first. Okay, so um, the, there's a sea of delocalized electrons which, which can move around a potential gradient. Cool. Awesome. And then, yep. And then a yeah, melting point. There's a strong electrostatic force of attraction between the metal cations and the pool of delocalized electrons. Yep. Nice. Um, does someone want to take malleability or shininess? Uh, Prisha. Um, I can do shininess. Um, it's because the electron C model, um, since there's so many electrons in so many different levels, they emit like all different wavelengths and it kind of merges and becomes white light, right? Nice. Cool. And malleability. Uh, Catherine. Um, metals are malleable because the electrons in the electron C, they're not tied to one specific atom so they can like move freely and like you can just mold them in whatever way you want. Cool. Awesome. Great job, guys. Yeah, yeah. Shyness is explained by band theory. I think she was kind of touching upon that without exactly saying the electron C model, but basically there's like all these little energy levels where the electrons can like go between. Same with melting point. Yeah, does someone want to restate the high melting point rationale? One thing that I like to think about is that you have all these electrons and you have to like raise the energy of like all of them to melt. Um, yeah. Cool. Awesome. I, if TAs can like type in the chat too, because I sometimes think it's like easier to look at a typed out explanation as well. Um, I'm going to head on to the next slide so we stay on time. Um, yep, here's just a summary of them as well. Um, then we have band theory. 
So as the shell number increases, the shells get closer together and you kind of have these like overlaps and stuff. Um, so here you have your band gaps and you have your bonding band and your anti-bonding. Um, and it just kind of looks like this continuous band. Um, and then your band gap is this small difference. So it's a small gap for metals and a large gap for insulators and semiconductors. And then the melting point of metals increases with more bonding bands and decreases with more anti-bonding like band electrons that got cut off. But like the more electrons you have in bonding, the um, higher the melting point. And then more in anti-bonding that decreases the melting point. Cool. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'm gonna hand it to the next team. I'm gonna look at the chat and kind of answer your guys' questions in there, but yay. Okay, Heather. Okay, um, so with packing efficiency, um, here's a nice diagram just to put everything together. So we have simple cubic, body center cubic, face center cubic. It's good to know all of these coordination numbers, the atoms and the packing efficiencies. That way, if you're given like problems where you have to solve for one of these things, you're able to connect the dots um, based on what you're given and solve for whatever variable you need. So with the packing efficiency, um, something to note is that metals usually pack into more efficient arrangements because we have the um, all of them are in the same size compared to the ionic solids where we have um, to con pair like looking at the different size of the ions and the interstitial spaces sometimes it's not always in the most efficient packing scheme um, and then at, up at the top of that slide we see a couple of um, things so in the comparison between like centimeters versus picometers that's like something that's important to remember when you're doing the conversions make sure your units always match up and then also um, in calculating packing efficiency volume of the units of the atoms in a unit cell over the volume in a cube. Um, and then also higher packing efficiency um, corresponds to higher atomic orbital overlap and higher coordination numbers. So when we have um, higher packing efficiency, we have um, these more favorable interactions. And then next slide, please. Okay. All right, and then for ionic bonding. so. It's important to recognize that in ionic bonding, we are not sharing electrons. Electrons are only localized on one of the ions. So that's the polar opposite of electron C with the metals where the electrons can move around. Ionic bonding, they are where they are. So with ionic bonding, this happens in a lattice because when we have the positive and the negative charges that come together in a lattice structure, the multiple coulombic interactions make it favorable. So that's how it stays. If it was just a single ionic bond though, that's unfavorable. So that's why it has to form in a lattice. Um, and so we see like the Cl minus and the Na plus, that's a favorable coulombic interaction. So we have it organized in a way where we are minimizing repulsions and increasing the number of attractive forces. And next slide, please. Okay. And for a little bit more bionic bonding, so you can think of it as like one type of ion forming a lattice first and the other ones filling in the interstitial spaces, which are the holes in between and the gaps. Um, and as I said earlier, sometimes that may lead to less efficient bonding compared to metals. Um, and then a couple of the properties similar to um, what Maya covered with the metals in this case for ionic bonding. First of all, ionic solids are good electrical insulators. So the reason for that is because the electrons are not free to move around, they're localized on where they are on the ion. And then for brittleness, so if we try to like hit an ionic solid, that will disrupt the ions and where they're positioned. So in a lattice, we have the positive and the negative ions close together where they are, so we're maximizing the columbic attractions. But if we hit a metal, I mean, if we hit a solid and then we displace those ions, then we can, disrupt the bonding because then there may be some positive ions close to each other and then that would increase the repulsion forces. And then with the high melting point, that's just due to the strong positive and negative attractions in that lattice, the strong coulombic interactions that we have and make it hard to separate. Um, however, when it is in the liquid or in a solution form where we have just the ions free floating, that can allow for conductivity because the charges can then carry a current. 
and then a side. All right. And then for coordinate covalent bonding, so when we learned about this, it we have basically a set of electrons coming from just one partner rather than one electron from each sharing together. So with coordinate covalent, it's usually donating to a female center. And then these ligands that we see at the bottom are just some common ones that we've seen in class. So it's good to just be able to recognize those when they come up. Next slide. Okay, and then for the 18 electron rule, um, that's just adding up together the number of valence electrons that we have from the metal center, plus the electrons that are given by the ligands, and that will add up to 18. And so, for example, if we have Zn2+, plus, that's the electron configuration where we see we have 10 electrons. And so if we need to satisfy the 18 electron rule, that means we have to have eight more electrons from the ligands. So if we have a monodentate ligand, that can be four, or if it's a bidentate, that would be two bidentate ligands. Um, next slide, please. Great. And then for crystal field theory, um, as the ligands are approaching the metal center, the electrons of the d orbitals are raised because as we have the electrons coming together, we have electron electron repulsions that come into play. And something to recognize here is when we have the d orbital splitting, that's due to energy not being raised equally due to differences in orbital overlap, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Okay, so there's octahedral and tetrahedral that we learned. For octahedral, um, here is a splitting pattern as you see in that graph over there. We see that the on-axis orbitals are raised higher than the off-axis orbitals. And the reason for that is as the ligands are coming together and towards the middle center, um, the on-axis ones have a greater overlap. So that's why the splitting is higher for those. Um, both of them are raised though, but it's just the on-axis ones that are raised higher. And then next for tetrahedral. Okay, and then for tetrahedral in this case, the way that the geometry is structured makes it so that's flipped. So in this case, the off-axis orbitals are raised higher than the on-axis orbitals. Um, and then also another thing to recognize here is that the splitting between the tetrahedral um, is smaller than the one with the octahedral. And the reason for that is just the, how the overlap works. So on with the octahedral, we have greater overlap. Means everything's like a 90 degree angle over there. So in this case with the tetrahedral, it's less of a direct overlap. So we have less of a splitting. Okay. And then for colors, so always remember that the color that you see, so the color that's transmitted, is always the opposite of the color that is absorbed. So you can draw yourself like a nice color wheel, as you see at the bottom, just like a Roy G. Viv all the way around. Um, so you can recognize, like, for instance, if I see red, then um, that means that it's absorbing green and vice versa. And then also we see like a list of ligands and metal ions that just shows us um, like which ones are strong field ones versus weak field ones. And so with the, the ones on the right, those ones are the stronger ones and the ones on the left are the weaker ones. So if it's on the right, it would be absorbing um, purple. So it's a higher splitting than something that's absorbing red. Okay, and next slide, I believe. Yes, we have questions now. Cool. Um, so I'll give you guys like so amount of time. Um, get, do like a thumbs up once you like drew it um, and kind of came up with an answer so I can see where you guys are. But until then, I'll, I'll be like looking at the chat and looking at more questions. Um, yeah, so just do a thumbs up when you are good with this problem and when there's like a good number of you, we'll go through it.
How are y'all feeling about this? Um, do a thumbs up if you want like two more minutes. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. And I think I caught up on questions. So if I missed yours, just send me another chat and I'll answer it again or whatever. <laughs> Thanks. You guys can give me a thumbs up if you're ready. That'd be awesome. I think we're doing fine on time, so, uh, so far. So I can give you like another minute. Cool, I see a few thumbs up. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so if people can put in the chat and just spam it a bit with what um, like diatomic molecule they thought it 
was that'd be awesome yeah woo, i see a sea of n2s for the most part awesome yay okay great um <laughs> now um does anyone want to explain like i don't know how much you can explain without doing this but um why they picked n2 just kind of like on a broad scale bird's eye view english is not my strong suit yeah alex so a majority of these like if you were to draw the molecular overload diagram for a lot of these molecules you'll find that a lot of them are actually paramagnetic so it has unpaired electrons so because the question said that it has to be diamagnetic you can cross out b2 c2 uh and then when you get to n2 right, and o2 and f2 i believe so when you get to n2 right it it qualifies for the second and the third so that that kind of tells me that it's n2 nice yeah and I, i'll show you guys the picture of this too so it makes a little bit more sense yeah Exactly. So when you draw this, they all are like in the 2p row. So you already know that you're going to have like these ones and these ones. It's just like how many electrons you have. Um, and we know that there's three electrons in the 2p for each nitrogen. And when you combine that, you will get um, no unpaired electrons, which is the third observation. Um, no unpaired electrons is diamagnetic. Cool. And um, for the other two observations, um, I know it's here, but does anyone want to say in their own words too what they said? So the first observation, again, was just like the ionization energy of the molecule is greater than that of the individual atoms. Does someone want to just like explain that in their own words? Yeah, Drew. Um, so I just use the notion that ionization energy is equal to the negative of the potential energy. And since we know that like the potential energy of a shared electron is automatically lower coulombically just because it's attracted to two nuclei. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I like to think about ionization energy, that like magnitude difference between potential energy into zero. Cool. Um, yeah. So just kind of showing it here visually, you have this ionization energy for the individual N atom, but when you have a shared, the highest energy level would be this sigma 2p, and that is a much larger like magnitude of energy, so you have a greater ionization energy there. Um, cool. And then for observation two, which was the bond strength of the neutral molecule is greater than the bond strength of either the negative ion or positive ion of the molecule. Um, that's just kind of going towards bond strength. <clears throat> um, and so you know that if you added another electron, you'd be adding to the antibonding, which would weaken it. Adding an electron always weakens the bond strength. And then here, if we removed an electron from the bonding, we'd also weaken it. So we're kind of at this like sweet zone where we filled all the possible bonding orbitals, but we haven't filled any of the antibonding, which makes it the strongest possible. Um, yay, and two, important. Uh, comes up later too. Awesome. Um, cool, cool. Any questions on this? All right. If you do, just send a question chat thing and you can work on the caffeine example, which is my favorite. All right. I'll give you guys, it should not take as long. So I'll give you like three minutes or two, or just thumbs up when you're ready.
I did get a question about what Part B is asking. Do you remember that slide a few, like, few back where it basically showed the unhybridized energy levels of all the orbitals versus the hybridized like energy levels? So just kind of drawing those out. So doing like a before and after. Okay, I realized I shared one of the answers, so I'm just going to go ahead and go over it. Um, so, yeah, so what we have here is sp2, so you see three electron domains around the carbon. Um, and then two, you have sp3, so this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, I know there's some confusion about it, with the like unpaired, not unpaired, well yeah, basically just like not in a bond electron, so these ones are not in a bond, but so it's four electron domains. Um, and then this one is sp3. Yay. Okay. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at how they drew for part B? Like what, what did they draw? Do they want to explain it with words? Yeah, Ryan. Or if your hand's still up. Yeah. Okay. I kind of chickened out and put my hand down, but you called me, so it's too late. Um, so basically you put an S orbital, just like one line you know, somewhere. And then you put the three P orbitals at the same uh, energy level that's like closer to zero because there's more electrons, so it's gonna be higher energy. Um, and then you put three more SP3, uh, like that's like right in between, it's like an average of the two energies because they're hybridizing. Um, and you fill those with whatever electrons and then there's still one left over P. So that should also be writ rewritten, but just one and at the same energy level as the other piece. Nice, exactly. Um, so just kind of like putting a picture to those words. So you have originally your 2s and your 2p, um, my fancy drawing skills. <laughs> so you have for this one, which would be I think the atom one, right? So we know it's um, a carbon, so we'll have four electrons. So two in the 2s, two in the 2p, unpaired right here. Um, and when you're drawing, try your best, um, as Ryan said, to kind of put like the um, sp2 like in between in the energy levels. And it's going to be slightly closer to the 2p than 2s, but my drawing skills are not that phenomenal. But somewhere kind of in that, you want like to have them kind of line up with the 2p being similar to what this is, to the 2p, and then the sp3 being slightly higher. Um, and then in order to figure out like, okay, how many electrons, like where the electrons go, you know, here that you have these, um, kind of three electron domains. So you're going to have for each of those sigma bonds, for each of those sigma bonds, you're going to have one unpaired electron. So you're going to have one here, one here, one here. And then you also have this double bond, which signifies that you have a pi bond. So, you know, you'll have to have a nice unhybridized P orbital and that's where that one electron goes. Um, yeah, I would say this is like a general rule of thumb if they ask you to like draw this process of hybridization, like showing before and after. Um, they might just ask you to show like it after, um, but if they ask about the process of hybridization, don't show both. Um, yeah, so double bonds count as one electron domain. Um, yeah, so triple bonds are one electron domain, double bonds are one electron domain. Um, the way I like to think about this, I think I might have just misspoken, was just like, this is the sigma bonds. So right here, in each double bond, there's one sigma bond, one pi bond. In a triple bond, there's one sigma bond and two pi bonds. Um, but basically, these represent each of the sigma bonds. So the CN bond here, CN bond here, and CO bond here. Um, cool. I did get some questions on the previous ones. So I'm just going to loop back um, a little bit, if I can. Um, so one of them was like why C2 wouldn't work. So C2 would not have this like, uh, like electrons here, like those like nitrogen has one extra electron each. So you would have, it's true that you would have um, diamagnetic because there'd be no unpaired electrons. But if you look at observation two, um, what it's asking you is that like, if you add an additional 
electron, it will go into the bonding, which will strengthen it. So therefore your bond is not like maximum strength. So that's why C2 would not work in this case. You wanna make sure that you have the maximum amount of bonding, like electrons in the bonding orbital. And then I think I got um, another question about if we added an electron to the antibonding, it would still be a favorable bond. It just wouldn't be as strong. Cool. I hope that answered all of it. And I'm going to hand it off to Heather and her question. Yay. So this question just has two parts, calculating the packing efficiency of palladium. And then once you get that, then choosing which packing scheme that we are at. And just give me like a yes or a thumbs up something when you're done so I can get a gauge.
All right, I think I'll go over it now. So for part A, calculating the packing efficiency of palladium, um, could you all just pop in the chat what you got for that percentage? Great, yeah, I see a lot of 74s. Awesome. All right, um, and then next slide, please. Okay, so there are different ways to do it. This is one way. Um, so the answer is 74.1 if we're looking at um, sig figs. So in this case, with the packing efficiency, what I did was packing efficiency can be calculated by the density of the solid um, of the lattice over the density of the atom. And so what we were given was what I noted here in green. So the density of the solid was given as 11.9 grams per centimeters cubed. Um, but what I don't have is the density of the atom. So that is what we need to solve in purple. So for calculating the density of the atom, that's just the mass of the atom over the volume of the atom. In calculating the mass, um, we need to convert the molar mass into um, the correct units. So we use Avogadro's number. And then in the denominator here with the volume, um, that's just the volume of the sphere. So we have that given as well for the radius. And you just need to convert from picometers to centimeters. So make sure you remember the 10 to the negative 10 conversion factor. And so once you get that, you should get 16.06 grams per milliliters. Um, I mean, grams per mole, sorry, that should be moles. And then once you plug that into the packing efficiency, then you'll have 74.1%. And then for a packing scheme, that is closest, cubic closest packing. And you know that because 74 is what matches up. If you remember from a couple of slides ago when we had that chart, 74 was the one that connects to that packing efficiency scheme. All right, and then next slide. Okay, and then this is all another way that I found that you could also do it um, as long as, your rationale makes sense and that um, what you're making, when you're making like the equal signs in your equation, like everything cancels out to have the units match and works logically, then it should be okay. Um, in this case, for hacking efficiency, they did the volume of the atoms over the volume of the unit cell, calculated that, and then they used the density information in a different way to then calculate the packing efficiency. Um, you can feel free to screenshot this or anything as well. Okay, and then next slide, please. Okay, this is the last question for unit three. Um, so given this graph, it might be a little hard to see, so I'm just gonna explain the axes real quick. Um, on the left axis, I mean, on yeah, on the axis of the Y, it's absorbance and then X axis is the wavelength. So given the information of I minus, BR minus, CL minus, Still minus is the strongest one here with the field strength. So you should match the plot ABC with whatever is in this graph. So putting your letters in based on the plot. And again, just put a thumbs up when you're ready.
Okay, so I'm seeing some thumbs up, so I'm gonna go ahead and go over it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the answer, it would be C, B, and then A. So just walking through how you would get this. So first of all, writing out um, the increasing field strength. So Cl minus would have the highest field strength compared to the other two ions. And we know that high field or strong field corresponds to a large delta in splitting. So a large delta in splitting means that we have a large energy transition between the d orbitals. And when we have that large energy transition, that essentially means that we have high energy that has to be absorbed if we're going from one to the other. So if we have high energy, that corresponds to either high frequency or small wavelength that's absorbed. So if we look over here with A, um, the smallest wavelength that's absorbed would be with A, and the largest um, wavelength that's absorbed is with C. They're just kind of graphs that are moved either left or to the right slightly. So because A corresponds to the smallest wavelength, that corresponds to basically the highest energy. And so that would match with the CL, and then we would go down for B and then C. And um, I'll try to answer some questions in the chat, but just for sake of time, I'll let Travis go on to unit four. Travis, do you want to take control of the sharing or do you want me to just? Uh, either way, I, I'm fine either way. I can, I can share too if that works right. better. Um, I might, I don't know how organized my slides are. So like I might have to go back and forth a lot. Yes, okay. I'm a little bit behind. Oops. Okay. Can y'all see? Yeah, okay. Sweet. Great. Um, so unit four, this one's pretty short. But so the first thing to that I kind of thought was important was so heat versus temperature. Uh, so one will go up when the other goes up, but the important thing to know here is that they're not like directly proportional. Like if the temperature goes up four degrees, you're not going to like put in four joules of heat or something. It depends on it's proportional by the specific heat capacity, which is basically what this equation is saying is that the heat that you put in or take out from a substance is going to be proportional to the specific heat or going to be proportional to the temperature change by the specific heat capacity. Um, so if you just look at the units for it, um, I think that's the easiest way to go about it. Um, it's basically saying, if you put like, for example, for water, if you put in 4.184 joules of heat into the water, then you will heat one gram of water up one degree Celsius. So that's basically all the heat capacity is saying. So then if you have a lower heat capacity, then that means like, let's say the heat capacity was two, then you're going to have, well, then it's just going to, the temperature is going to go up faster with a given heat increase. So if it was whatever half of 4.184 is, let's just say it's two, then this is going to increase two degrees when you put in 4.184 joules. Um, so that's how they're proportionate to each other. And that's an important concept to know. Um, so this is applied in calorimetry, but, um, so we'll always be assuming basically the idea of the experiment is just to burn whatever you're trying to find, how much energy is in it, usually by combustion, well, it is combustion. Um, and assuming that the calorimeter doesn't take in any heat or doesn't absorb any of the heat, and it's just the water, usually it's water that's surrounding whatever you're burning, then the heat that is that the substance has is going to be, or the heat of the combustion reaction is going to be equal to the heat gained by the water. So if you're given a certain amount of water that increases by a certain temperature, you already know the heat capacity of water. And so then you can find how much heat goes into it to give a certain temperature increase of the water. And that would be your heat of the combustion reaction. So that's what calorimetry is doing. Um, the same idea with like the, 
drop like palladium or something in water, like if it's at 200 degrees, and then the equilibrium temperature drops to whatever, um, like 28 degrees from the original 22 degrees substance or 22 degrees water, then it's the same idea, like the heat lost by the metal, because heat is always going to flow to where the temperature is lower, where there's low, a lower amount of heat. Heat is lost. Um, every all the heat lost by the metal is going to be heat gained by the water and you can figure out how much heat goes in as long as you know the temperature difference and the um, heat capacity of the distance and the mass um so hess's law basically the general idea of it is for any state function you don't need to know the exact path of the reaction, you can use any path you want to get there as long as you know the initial and final states. Um, how this applies to enthalpy, which is a state function, um, in our cases, means that you can combine any reactions you want as long as the reactions that you combine cancel out the unwanted elements and substances on either side in order to create the final reaction that you're trying to get. Um, and this will make more sense in a second in the next slide. Um, and then this is also kind of unrelated, but um, with the Q equals MC delta T, um, basically you're calculating the delta H for our purposes in this class because at constant pressure, um, Q is going to equal the change in enthalpy. Um, so that's another way to find that change in enthalpy without using Hess's law necessarily. Um, you can use this equation. Um, Okay, so now, oh wait, sorry, there's a lot of chats. Am I not answering stuff? Um, anyway, um, so using Hess's law with the reactions, there's basically just four steps that you want to kind of keep in mind. So the idea, like I mentioned, is just to cancel out all the unwanted um, reactants in the final product. So you get a bunch of different reactions. I know that we had this on the PhD day, um, but you're basically given reactions or given combustion reactions, you have to write them out. Um, and then you can manipulate them by either multiplying a reaction, and then you have to make sure to multiply, and you'll multiply every single substance in that reaction by the same amount, the same scalar, and then you'll multiply the change in enthalpy by, of that reaction by the same scalar. Um, you can switch the reactants and products, basically putting them on separate different sides of the arrow than they're originally on. And then you're going to want to change the um, sign of the enthalpy. Um, and to figure out exactly like what operation you want to do, you kind of just want to look at what your final products are and then try to find them in the building make builder reactions basically that you're given um and so you'll figure out like for example in this reaction i guess this one is just kind of canceling stuff but yeah in other reactions let's say you had like one c here and then you see that you need two c's there so then you're going to want to multiply this whole thing by two so always do it with reference to like where the reactants that are going to be in the final um product are in in the component um, built the reactions. So um, there's two different ways to do this. Uh, with bond energies, the intermediate atoms will always be, or sorry, the intermediates are atoms and they will always be, because they are atoms, they will always be higher in energy than both the reactants and the products. So to figure out the ordering in the energy diagram of Sorry, they'll be higher in energy. I don't know if I said that. But in order to figure out the energy ordering of the reactants, products, and over and the intermediates, all you have to know is the total change in energy of the reaction. And you can look at the sign of that to figure out whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. And that will determine if reactants are products or on top. Um, so in the next slide, uh, this explains the formula for the um, bond energy method, but it's the same idea as Hess's law. So you're always going to go from reactants, or it is Hess's law, but you're always gonna go from reactants to atoms to products. Um, 
because the bond energies, the definition of them is literally like how much energy is in each bond. Um, you're going, you're breaking all the bonds in the reactants to the component atoms, and you're breaking all the energies in the products to the component atoms, and you're finding how much total energy that would produce. Now, in the case of going from reactants to intermediates, that's going to be literally the reaction you're trying to find. So you just take that energy. But when you're going from atoms to products, the intermediates to the products, you're going to want to reverse that reaction. So you're going to want to be forming the products from the intermediate atoms. So because you're trying to do that, that's why you will subtract the products. Um, you're basically taking the negative delta H of that reaction, um, which is exactly what I was talking about in this slide. I believe it's rule three, yes. Okay. Um, so you'll need the Lewis structures for this method. That's important. So you will need, like, let's say you have three CH4. You'll need to have know that CH4 is a C with four single CH bonds. And then you'll have 12 in all because you'll have to multiply three times the four CH bonds. Um, so make sure to include your stoichiometric coefficients. Um, and the most important thing to remember um, is that these are only estimates of bond energy. Using the bond energy method will only give you an estimate of the total um, change in enthalpy in the reaction because it is an average, as you guys learned in the last PhD, PhD day, it is an average of the bond energy with it, a, around multiple molecules. So like, let's say you take the single CH bond, it depends, the energy in that bond depends on what is around it and the rest of the molecule. So more electronegative atoms next to it will change the, ener the energy of that bond. Um, more double bonds or triple bonds on either side of that single CH bond will also change the order of it, among other things, or resonance. Um, but yeah, so remember that. So now heat of formation, on the other hand, you are looking at the elements. So that's how that's different than looking at the atom. How is that different than looking at the atoms? Well, a lot of substances do exist in their atomic form. But the main difference that I think you should know is diatomic gases, they're different. So because diatomic gases exist in, as a molecule, you're not always going, when you go from intermediates, from, from the reactants to the intermediates and then to products, you're not always going to have the intermediates at the highest level. Um, and so that's when you have to pay a lot more attention in the energy diagrams. You have to pay a lot more attention to the heat of formation of both the reactants and the products, as well as the heat of formation of, or sorry, the total change in enthalpy of the reaction. Um, so now going to the reaction pathway, here you're taking the elements and literally you're looking at the reaction that it, the reaction that would occur if you took the elements and you formed the reactants from their component elements, and then you took the elements and you formed the products from the same elements because the reactants and products are gonna be composed of the same elements. Um, now that said, like I was talking about earlier, you're still going from reactants to intermediates to products, but now you have a heat of formation that's going the opposite way to form the reactants. So now you have to basically reverse this reaction and make the reactants negative. Um, and so you're basically reversing the heat of formation reaction versus here, now you're going from intermediates to products and you are, you are going the same way as the reaction. So you don't have to reverse it. So that thus you have products minus reactants. So still pay attention to stoichiometric coefficients, though. Those are important. You just don't have to worry about the Lewis structures or any of that stuff. And another plus is that you will get the exact enthalpy change of the reaction because the heat of formation from its component elements will not vary with this because you're trying to form the whole molecule. So it's not going to vary with the surrounding, like different parts of the molecule in different ways. It's not an average of bonds or anything. It's just the energy of different reactions. So... Now, 
Um, yeah, that's all I had. Um, I'm sure you guys probably have some questions on that because I went kind of fast, sorry. But um, uh, yeah, Will, do you have a question? Yeah, um, one question I have is, um, so there are kind of the two different ways to do it. Um, there's like the um, heat of formation and like the bond energy. Could you just go over, I'm a little bit confused as to like when you would use each of them. Like, would you, could you only use the bond one if you actually like had the Lewis structures drawn for you? Or I'm just trying to think of like, when I see a question, how do I know whether I should use the heat of formation or the bond energy? So yeah, I can, I can actually just kind of explain it with this slide, but basically you're going to get asked to use to do it a certain way so like for example number two so in number one you'll write out the chemical reaction um that represents the heat of formation of nh3 um then once you have that reaction you will know what the reactants are in that reaction and the products are and i'll give you a hint they are some combination of HH bonds, NH bonds, NN bonds, NN double bonds, and NN triple bonds. Um, and what you will do then is you will use these tabulated bond energies, multiply them by how many are in each molecule, stoichiometric coefficients, all of that, and then apply the bond energy formula. And it's the same way with heat of formation, you will be asked. And so that is exactly what you get. I can't see because I have this in the way. That is exactly what or a similar idea to what you're getting in question four. It's just asked a little bit differently. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it does. But yeah, just work on this problem and then I can answer any questions. Oh, y'all are working, I guess.
Okay, how is everybody doing with that? Have you finished all four parts? You stuck on any? Any thumbs up if you're finished with all four parts, I guess. Okay, got one. Okay. Thumbs up if you're not finished with all four parts. Oh, okay. Um, well, I guess I'll just go ahead and go over then. Um, so for the first reaction, you're calculating the heat of formation of NH3. So will you use your, will you use its constituent elements or will you use its constituent atoms? Got some, yes, elements. Um, so, You'll use the constituent elements and, okay, so I wrote it all on one slide, so don't look past question one, but this will be your correct answer because H2 and N2 both exist in diatomic form. Okay, so why would you know to use elements? That is a good question. Um, if I can go back, I can try it. Oh, there we go. Okay, so you will use elements here because you are told that it is the heat of formation, which means that you're forming NH3 from its constituent elements. It's literally just a reaction. I guess that's the point I'm trying to get across, is that you're literally just taking... It's a formation reaction where you take the elements of the substance, and then you form the substance from its constituent elements. Um, and so, uh, then on part two, this should be a very mathy calculation. Um, but uh, does anyone want to share what they got? Or type it in the chat. Either way. Yeah, so make sure to include that sign. And yes, so negative 40 and negative 80 are actually both correct. Um, this answer, I know that this is a little bit weird, but this answer will be the same, or sorry, will be correct whether you balance it this way or whether you take the halves of this. So you do three halves H2, three halves N2, or sorry, one half N2, and then NH3, um, you will get half of the reaction energy. Um, and I believe that either Dr. Kincaid or Dr. Tran talked about this in class, but both answers will be accepted. Um, yeah. So now, um, does anyone want to raise their hand on this one? This one might be a little bit of a mouthful to type out. But does anyone want to um, answer why the heat of formation value of NH3 is a little bit different than what you calculated from the bond energies? Any hands? Okay. Um, Wait one second. Sorry, I have to pull. Oh crap! I'm I'm really hacking right now. Um, uh, I can't see their name, but it starts with an A. I got that part. Um. Uh yes. Sorry, whoever has their hand up, I can't see your name for some reason. But I think this you're forgetting. Oh, student. Alois, what's up? Okay, yeah. Answer. Okay, it's because <laughs> the bond energy values are only estimates, and they yes. are. Exactly. Well, so they're actually, they're est I wouldn't call it estimates. I would say they're more averages. Um, but yeah, that's the right idea. It's basically just because they are not the specific um, 
bonds that we're looking for. So in order to get the exact bond energy through this calculation with for NH3, you would have to literally find the bond, the NH bond energy in an NH3 molecule um, and then multiply that by three because there are NH bonds in other molecules that would have different, um, yeah, different energies. Anyway, so for question four then, um, okay, yeah, so we're getting a question, why are negative 40 and negative 80 both answers? So it all has to do with how you balance the reaction. So I should have written the other reaction up here, but because the in this in this reaction you have three H two plus N two yields two N H three, um, you you could also balance it with halves of these coefficients. So you would do three halves H two plus one half N two yields N H three, um, and this would get you. 40 kilojoules per mole instead of 80 kilojoules per mole. This balanced reaction will get you 80 because you're multiplying by the stoichiometric coefficients. And so if the stoichiometric coefficients are twice as much, you will get an answer that is twice as much. Um, I thought it would be 80 kilojoules per mole because of it. So it would not, I think I might've done that wrong, but it, the answer is, yeah, okay. Is, yeah, it'll, Isabella's got it in control. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, it is a negative answer. Um, I don't know if that text answers your question, no, but. Um, the heat of formation be the kilojoules released per two moles. Oh, I see what you're saying. So either way, it's still... <sighs> yes, technically yes. So I guess you're right. You could... that. Okay, so then you could just say negative 40. Um, but either, I guess the point I'm trying to get across is that either answer would be accepted on the test. Sorry. Um, but yes, you could say either of these. Um, yeah, so why do we do reactants minus products and not products minus reactants? So because this is, so... A heat of formation reaction is, like I said, literally just a reaction, right? So because this is just, it's just like any other reaction, um, don't worry about the fact that it's a heat of formation reaction, although it is. But um, so, I'm sorry, someone just called me. Anyway, um, I don't know how to get back to where I was earlier. Um. Okay, this is unfortunate. Uh, so, yeah. So, then, because you're you're using bond energy still to find the energy of this reaction, right? So, because you're still using bond energies, you're still going to do reactants minus products instead of products minus reactants. Um. But if we yeah, were using heat of formation, it would be the other way around. Um, Is it correct to say that if we were, if we didn't have the bond energy tables and we had heat of formation for the um, products and reactions instead, we would be using it, it would be the other way around. It would be products minus reactants. Yeah. Well. Okay. But if you so if you had the heat of let's say you had the heat of formations for H two, what would the heat of formation for H two be? Zero. Okay. And what would the heat of formation for N2 be? Zero, I guess. 
Yeah, so then the heat of formation of the reaction would just be the heat of formation of NH3. Does that make sense? Yeah. So okay. you would still that technically would still be products minus reactants. Oh, sorry. It would still be products minus reactants. It would just be products minus zero, right? Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. sure. That makes sense, actually. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Uh, Alois, did you have a question? No. Oh, you just, okay, you just had your hand up. You're good, you're good. Um, uh, wait, I, okay. Um, so I think I have not gone over four yet. Did anyone else have any other questions on that part? Sorry, I know that was kind of long. But. Okay. Um, so then we will go back to question so we already answered three. Um, four, the um, enthalpy of combustion of NH3 to form water and nitrogen gas. So it's just a normal combustion reaction. I would definitely know how to write out a combustion reaction. Um, and this is, again, this is kind of what I was talking about with the heat of formation of elements being zero earlier. Um, but so once you write out this reaction, you're given the heat of formation of H2O, and you know that the heat of formation of N2 is zero, and you know that the heat of formation is O2 is zero because they're in their elemental form. So then you, and you already have this from part, I, I mean, I guess you could use either reaction, but you could use, use either the part given to you in three or what you calculated. Um, I would use in three, but then you can calculate from the products minus reactants formula to get um, this answer. Does anyone have any questions on that? How did you know it was N2 as opposed to like NO2 or NO3 or something? Did, is this a reaction we're supposed to know? Oh, sorry. Um, so, yeah, okay. Oh, sure, the problem's at it. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that's actually a good point to bring up though, because in combustion reactions, if it's not the traditional, whatever a hydrocarbon is, plus O2 yields CO2 and H2O, if it's not that, they will probably give you whatever the other, that, that would be the only version that they would expect you to know, um, other than knowing that combustion is burning something with O2. Um, so they, if like, for example, in this, if you had an N, they would give you the fact that it's forming nitrogen gas instead of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that before we move over to one shorter question? Cool. Okay. So this question is a bit shorter. You're just drawing an energy diagram, but it's asking you, to draw this energy diagram in terms of the heat of formation reaction given. Um, so I'll give you all a couple of minutes to do this. We'll take four minutes. Actually, yeah, I'll take four. If you have any questions about this question or anything else, don't be afraid to raise your hand. Um, oh, there's a lot of chats. So, oh, okay, sorry. Um, Okay, so the explanation for question one. Um, do you mean like the explanation for for question one, like is in part one of question one, or like all of question one? Okay, part one. Cool. Um, I don't. Hmm, okay. Uh, I hope. Does everyone have this down? I can go back real quick. I'll go back real quick. Okay, so um, 
the heat of formation reaction is just a reaction of a of the constituent elements of whatever substance you have forming whatever the substance whose heat of formation you're trying to find if that makes sense um so for example the heat of formation is o2 because o2 is in its elemental form and so if o2 would be the reactant that you're yielding o2 out of so it would just be o2 yields o2 and the heat of formation or the, re the the reaction energy of that reaction is zero but in this case you have the heat of formation of nh3 um and because it's formed from nitrogen and hydrogen you're going to have um h2 which exists in diatomic form and n2 which exists in diatomic form and then you'll just want to balance that um and like any other reaction it has its own energy of the reaction. Yeah, so the heat of, um, it, it, it'll give you the heat of formation of anything that you need to know. Um, and you need to know also that the elemental form is zero. Those are the only heats of formation that you need to remember. Um, um, let me do this. Did I miss some questions? Yeah, so, sorry, I'm getting a lot of questions. Is the AL203 supposed to be there? Yes, that is supposed to be there. Um, I think... I don't really compute. Table. Oh, yeah, sorry, the coefficient shouldn't be there. I, the, yeah, sorry, disregard that.
Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and go over this. Um, so if anyone wants to say what they have, uh, this one's kind of a big one, I know. But like, if you want to raise your hand, if not, we can also just go over the answer real quick. Okay, I think we're going to go over the answer real quick. Um, so the key to this is, again, to treat each keto formation reaction like it's its own reaction. Um, sorry, my handwriting is very messy. But um, what you'll want to do is... Sorry, does someone have a question? No? Okay. Um, what you'll want to do is look at the heat of formation of the reactants reaction, look at the heat of formation of the products reaction, and then look at the whole delta H of the reaction. And that will tell you, all. Th you will need all three of those in order to tell you the absolute energy level ordering of the reactants, products, and intermediate elements. Um, and the reason for that is because your elements could be higher or lower in energy than your reactants or products. Um, and so in order to figure out, um, you're basically all you're worried about here is the sign. So if delta HF is an exothermic process, then that means that your products, your, sorry, if your heat of formation of the reactants is an exothermic process, and that means that the products of that reaction will be lower in energy than its component elements. Um, and that's what you see here um, because it's a drop in energy. Um, yeah, Alois, what's up? Wait, there's something that I don't understand here. Because I think we're given the overall reaction on the equation in positive 8,999. So I assume that um, since that very well could be a typo. Oh, I think that's a typo. Yeah, sorry. So that should be a negative. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. That, oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. That should be a negative. Um, okay. So it should be negative. It should be exothermic. That really messes up the whole diagram. I can't believe I missed that. Okay. Um, yeah, you're right, though. So let's just do it as if this was positive. <laughs> um, Actually, no, that'll confuse a lot of people. Let's just do this as if it was negative. So um, if this was negative, then, so this is negative 8,999, then you're going to have the whole process also being exothermic. Um, and if you look at that heat of formation of the product, which you can do by the values that I gave you in this table, um, seeing that all these heater formations are negative and adding them up, them up with the stoichiometric coefficients, you will know that the overall process is going to have a negative heat of formation of the products. So you will also, that will also be going down. So using those three, you should be able to know. Exactly true. Okay. Oh, push-ups. Um, I can do push-ups. Uh, I don't have like the whole setup Kincaid does, but um, yeah, let's see what we can do here. Um, how many y'all want? That's like that's got to be a lot. That was like that was pretty bad. Um, I'll just do ten to start. Y'all think that should warrant more? Let me know. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah, don't disrespect cross country runners. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, did I miss? I'm sorry if I missed any questions up there. Oh, 8,000. Uh, that'll, that'll take a couple of days. I can get there, but, um, Um, okay, um, let's see, what else do we have? Sorry, I'm sorry if I missed anybody's questions. Um, please, like, either you can copy and paste them back at the bottom, or, uh, 
specify the type. I feel like usually, uh, I feel like usually oh. there's like an up and down arrow, like going from the reactant, like up to the um, the constituent elements, and then down to the product. Is there a reason you didn't put those in here, or am I missing something? No. Yeah. 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 Um, so, like you're saying, a react basically an arrow going in the opposite like from basically the opposite way of the delta hf of the reactants. Yeah, that's what lecture, it seemed like there would be like a down arrow and an up arrow connected yeah. to the same two um, like things. So I think that was more just for the purposes of like the multiple choice, like which arrows are always going to be positive or negative. Um, and basically all an arrow going the other way would represent would be a basically the opposite reaction so it would be forming the constituent elements from your um from your products so kind of almost a decomposition reaction okay why so this looks like it's we're starting out i mean the way that i would see the diagram it looks like we're starting out with the constituent elements then we're going to the reactants then we're going to the products is yeah, that, I mean, that's not the way I originally thought of it. I thought you would go from the reactants up to the constituent elements and then back down to the products. Yeah, so um, so this is, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so if you were using HETA formation to calculate the overall delta H of the reaction, that's when you would use the arrows going the other way, like you're saying. So, or at least the arrow of the heat of formation of the reactants. Um, so you would go up and then down to find this, and you would add these two up. But here, you're trying to find the ordering of these in relation to each other. So you're trying to find the magnitudes of these three delta H's, and you know all three of them. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. Okay. Um, do we need to specify zero on the energy graph? I don't think it hurts. Um, yeah, you're not going to get counted off for it. So um, I would. Sorry, I did not hear. Um, so when the elements should be above or below the reactants. Yeah. So let's do a case. Like, let's say, actually, OK, this typo. We could actually, so, okay, first of all, clarifying the typo. So the main typo that I want you all to get is that this should be a negative right here. And the reason that this is so important is because if this is positive, then that means that these products are going to be above the reactants. So this would be here if, this, if that was positive. Um, but because it's negative, that means that the overall delta H of the reaction is an exothermic process. So you're going down in energy and releasing energy from the reactants to the products. Point to what should be negative again. Um, oh, like the number? Which number should be negative again? Yes, no. okay. First of all, so first of all, what should be zero on the graph? Zero should be up here somewhere. Um, so like basically the arrow would be a little bit taller and you just have like a zero line across the graph. Um, the number, uh, this number right here is gonna be negative. I don't think I can highlight it because I'm in presentation. It's the 8,999, the delta H of the total reaction. Um, and then going back to, can you clarify when the elements should be above or below the reactants? So, um, let's say that the, if the elements are in between the reactants and products right here, then that means that the reactants are going to be higher in energy and the elements are, or sorry, the products are going to be lower in energy. <laughs> Um, so therefore, 
you're going to have an endothermic reaction for the heat of formation of the reactants, and you're going to have an exothermic reaction for the heat of formation of the products. So the way that would change things is then your heat of formation of the reactants, which is endothermic, is going to have a positive delta H, which here, if you look back, you are given um, this guy to be negative already, I believe. Because you're given this delta H guy right here. Um, would zero be where the elements are? So not quite. They would be higher than the elements um, because there's still diatomic elements and everything. Um, constituent atoms if we're using bond energies. I don't know about that one. Do any of the other TAs know? If it would be zero, if it was using, like it would be zero at the constituent atoms if you're using bond energies. Yes, this is the this is the last problem, but we have another slide after this, um, because there's one thing that I do want to emphasize that's um, it's not emphasized earlier, and my apologies on that. Um, any other questions on this that I missed? Um, I will answer some of these questions. And yeah, um, so the overall reaction drawn if you were given this delta H reaction to be positive, would be endothermic, where the products are higher in energy than the reactants. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and go, unless anyone has any other questions, let's go ahead and go to this last slide. Um, Okay, um, I think, do we have a last slide or should, I can also just explain this verbally. Um, yeah, we have a last slide for redox. Cool, cool. It's just a really quick slide. Yes, so the other thing that y'all need to look over is redox reactions um, briefly, just know be able to tell in a reaction which element is being oxidized and which is being reduced in each reaction by using um, use oil rig. I'll type that one in the chat. That one's pretty good. Um, but oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining electrons. Um, okay, so we got some questions. Is there ever a scenario when where the products or reactants will be higher in energy than the elements? Yes, so it's possible, like I was saying earlier, with the endothermic um, reaction. So an endothermic reaction in which if, if either of the heat of formation values are positive for either going to reactants or going to products, um, then you will have that value or if the heat of formation value of the reactants is positive you'll have the reactants above the constituent elements if the heat of formation of the products is positive you'll have the products over the constituent elements um how do we tell I'll, i can start answering questions in the chat too I'm just going to share the redox slide in case no one wants to see that. Yeah, that works.
Maya, did you want to explain this slide or are we just going to just out there? But yeah, okay. here's the redox reactions <laughs> as uh, Charles was explaining earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so just like a brief overview, reduction is the gain of electrons and oxidation is lost electrons. And you can use oil rig and there's also like a lion one, whatever floats your boat. Um, reducing agents are basically the one that is being oxidized. Um, they cause the other like chemical to gain electrons while oxidizing agents are the ones being reduced. Um, you'd also want to know like what it, like what the oxidation states are of things. Um, so just like knowing that like oxygen is used like minus two and just being able to assign what those oxidation numbers are. Um, there was rules that I think Dr. Tran or Dr. Cade went over at some point. There's like a little handy chart down here with some things as well, what the oxidation states are. Um, and here's a reaction kind of showing example of what's being oxidized and reduced. So you know that since your CO, Cu, copper, starts at zero and goes to two plus, you know that's the one being oxidized since it's going from a neutral value to a positive value. So it's um, losing electrons. And then the Ag plus is the one being reduced as it has a positive charge and goes to neutral state. So it's like gaining negatives and electrons are negative. So it's the one being reduced. Um, yeah. I've gotten, oh, sorry. Yeah, go I've, Travis. I've gotten, I've gotten a question multiple, like a couple of times that is asked, um, do we need to be able to balance half reactions? You know. So I don't quite remember in lecture, but if you guys did that in lab, it would be fair game. Um, just remember to like uh, balance both the number of electrons as well as the charges when you're doing those. Yeah. Oh, and that's just a general reminder too. Um, look, make sure to look over your lab stuff um, because sometimes there's like that question that they throw in there that you're like, where did this come from? But it's in your lab stuff. So don't forget that. I remember there was like a Beer's Law question. I was like, ah, yes, fun times. <laughs> it always does. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, I did have a request earlier to go over what I was saying uh, earlier about like the endothermic, um, like how you can tell where the ordering is going to be. Um, so you have to make sure that you're looking for the heat of formation diagram. You have to make sure that you are looking at the heat of the three separate reactions in the right way. So you're looking at the heat of formation of the reactants, you're looking at the heat of formation of the products, and you're looking at the overall delta H of the reaction. That said, if the heat of formation from elements to reactants is a positive delta H, meaning that it's an endothermic reaction, then that means that the reactants will be above the elements because you are going up in energy from reactants, which is the elements in this case, to the reactants of the reaction. Um, and then the same idea is true for products. Yeah, of course. We can